Hello, everybody. My name is Diana Lindsay, and welcome to another Sunbelt Spotlight. If you're here for the first time, a very warm welcome. Please join us once a month. We have these special features focusing on our authors and our books and have these wonderful presentations. So I'm really glad you could join us today because this is really special. We have an award-winning author and an award-winning photographer who have combined to make this absolutely amazing book on Bodie State Park. And today we are featuring our photographer, Will Furman. And I just got through kind of really going into detail on his biography. And boy, am I impressed. He, had, he is so talented and I'm even more impressed that he is and grateful that he's the photographer for this book. This man has had a career decades long in the, in the music film industry. Um, and he has, uh, just to give you an example of some of the things he's done, he has directed more than 80 films uh, on television, award-winning photographer. Uh, he has, uh, uh, won numerous awards, uh, seven Cine uh, Golden Eagles, three New York Film Festival awards, and over 50 other international film festival honors, honors. And he now specializes in still photography and focusing on images from nature. Uh, one of the fun things about him, he even is a, is, he sings and he plays music. He has uh, frequently sings the national anthem at major baseball league games and he does broadway shows rock and roll pop jazz numbers so he has a beautiful voice and and and, and he's so talented as a photographer so i feel so grateful again to have him as the photographer for this absolutely amazing book if you haven't seen it yet and by the way every time we do have our, our featured guests here. We do discount the book on our website. So if you're interested in Bodhi, Good Times and Bad, be sure to check out our Sunbelt website and we'll, we'll post it on the, the chat session so you can get the address and um, check it out because uh, the photography on here is amazing. And Will is going to be talking about how he does this and how he um, created the images for this book, which has won awards also. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Will Furman. Will, take it over. Hi. Well, thank you all for coming. Thanks for that very nice introduction, uh, Diana. Uh, Photography has always been exciting to me, and uh, it's very similar to music. Uh, the two are, I find, in this, in, inseparable. And uh, that's kind of what drew me to Bodie uh, as a ghost town. And after I've been photographing there for maybe 40 years, and uh, I discovered and developed this uh, technique, which I will talk about uh, in Bodie. Uh, and uh, so it's a, it's a very powerful place for me. So uh, without further ado, let's start into the book. Well, well, thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, you're in for an exciting 45 minutes because I'm going to take you to this uh, best preserved and most exciting ghost town in the Western United States. And if you haven't been to Bodie, it's just east of Yosemite National Park off S Scenic Highway 395. Uh, and uh, it really is a magical place unlike any other ghost town you will ever visit. Uh, and uh, so I'm gonna talk about the history of Bodhi and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about this new style of photography that you'll see scattered throughout this book, um, which are uh, seem like double exposures, but they're not. All right, so well, the history of Bodhi starts in 1859 when William Bodie discovered some gold in the mountains of Eastern California. Well, Bodie died in a surprise snowstorm that winter before he could develop it, but others soon found his site and then small mining camps sprang up. Leland Stanford created the Bodie Bluff Mining Company in 1863. He capitalized it, he said, at $1 million, but a few months later, he sold all his holdings 
for 500 bucks. <laughs> in the 1870s, Bodie was a dangerous remote place. There was little law and order, but there was gold to be had if you dug for it. Nearby Belmont, Nevada was a silver bonanza town of about 4,000 people, but the silver was starting to peter out. Some of the miners started to think about moving on. One family that decided to leave with the Brothertons and their five children. The night before their departure, the daughter knelt to say her prayers. She is rumored to have said, goodbye, God, we're going to Bodie. However, she could have said, good, by God, we're going to Bodie. We will never know the real answer to that. But it was a tough trek to Bodie from anywhere. The country was rugged and the roads poorly maintained. Bodie is in the high desert. It's at 8,400 feet elevation. Uh, it's 15 miles east of the Sierras and 10 miles north of Mono Lake. Mining towns attracted every kind of person. Notice there's no women in this photo. Their faces tell a lot of their story. But many miners came with their families. They made a home however they could. The families tried to live normal lives and in the early days, parents had to homeschool their kids. But soon there were 10 children to teach, but the first school was burned down by a dis disgruntled student. So the Bodhi citizens took over a boarding house. They added a cupola and a school bell and pronounced it a school. As more and more gold was discovered, the town got bigger and the number of families grew as well. Students soon numbered 150, but some of the boys were bullies. They put an ad in the paper for a teacher that needed to be big and strong, big and brave enough to control the students. The man hired said he would tend to it with his gun if necessary, but he didn't have to. Instead, he wielded a long handled stove poker, which in much of the year when it's cold up there could be heated in the stove. One fellow teacher recalled, he sure did handle those tough kids. Women in Bodhi learned early how to survive in the tough surroundings. Popular dime store novels celebrated the infamous. There was Three Finger Jack, Slapshot Sam, Dick the Dead-Eye Dandy, and Twilight Charlie, a highway bandit. Those were fictional adventure, adventures, but in real life, there was plenty of real danger. With gold ingots leaving Bodie every few days, there were plenty of opportunities for ambush. Even if there was no gold, passengers carried wallets, purses, and watches. Stages would sometimes stop at a place of a previous robbery and wait for the highwaymen to appear. This staged photo gives you a realistic idea of what it was like. The county kept a record of deaths, whatever the cause. Shootings were said to be a nightly occurrence, but the reputation of a bad man from Bodie spread. Passing through, Mark Twain said he would have it no other way. Virtue versus vice made for exciting times. Twain wrote, it is a plain wonder how a man can carry on in such circumstances. There were a lot of gunfights 
Many mornings, the undertaker or druggist would find a body on their doorstep. They called it a man for breakfast. Bodie earned a reputation as a violent, hell-bent corner of the desert west. There were serious consequences for tough talk. These are some of the quotes that were reported in the newspapers. Arguments were often settled with guns. On Main Street, Bill Dugan and Felix Donnelly dueled at long range. Nine shots were exchanged, but not even a bystander was killed. Bodie was called Bad Shot Gulch. There were bad men in Bodie, but they were bad shots too. The bad man from Bodie became an archetype riveting readers from San Francisco to New York City. Six-shot revolvers were not accurate except at close range. Many people carried a pocket-sized single-shot Derringer or a British Bulldog, a gun popular in Bodie. It could easily be drawn and fired at close range, the only distance it was accurate but it's likely that there were more deaths from mining accidents, pneumonia, cholera, and other causes than from gunfights. In 1882, the first church was built and the Methodist church still stands. Church attendance was strong. There was a lot to pray for or atone for. The Catholic Church burned in a fire and is no longer there. In the race to get the gold, many mines had little safety devices or procedures. They shored up workings only when necessary. Only one mine had safety cages, which had been common in the West for 10 years. In the race to go deeper, mine owners would skimp on pumping adequate air down to the workers. Then at 436 feet, the Bodie mine hit a very rich vein of ore. It was named after the Greek goddess of fortune, a favorite of miners. The Fortuna vein caused mine shares to jump from $6 to $60 a share. They followed the vein down, lost it, found it again, and at 600 feet, the vein widened into a real bonanza. One man's shovel full could be worth more than a year's wages. And with such unbelievable riches, some miners kept some of it for themselves, hiding it in their shoe or their lunch pail. Some of the men thought, well, the Lord put it in the ground. Didn't it belong to whoever found it? Uh, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 25, 4 says, Muzzle not the ox that treadeth the corn. For the next 350 feet, there were glorious riches. But then the vein forked, then fractured, and then gave out. They dug down hundreds of feet more, but found only fragments of the vein. At 1,200 feet, the search was abandoned, its lower workings left to decay, crumble, and collapse. Winter in Bodie was long and hard. At a mile and a half high, it was often the coldest place in California. Thermometers could reach minus 30 or minus 40. The loneliness and isolation was often cured by a visit to one of Bodie's 35 saloons. Sometimes the snow was so high you could only get out through a second story window. Drifts could easily be 15 feet or more. Notice the snow depth gauge on the left. 
with heavy snows. There was no mail, of course. So when it finally arrived, it was a big event. People entertained themselves with music or singing. You could hear pop songs and an opera. John McDonald was eloquent reciting Shakespeare and was known to quote the bard by the yard. There were dances. The union, the miners union hall floor was mounted on springs so that the dancing didn't shake the building apart. On Sundays, the day off, people would play in the snow. With 10 or 12 foot skis, they couldn't turn or break as today's skiers do. The only way down was straight down and to slow you drag the pole between your legs. Ski clubs were formed. Skiers were clocked to go as fast as 90 miles an hour, often ending in spectacular crashes. As early as page, age four, children were fitted with skins and skis. At 8,400 feet, winter finally ends around May. In 1879, a 21-year-old man came to town, John Stuart Kane. Astute and easygoing, he saw the great potential of Bodie. He parlayed his ownership of a piece of the Fortuna gold vein into owning the town bank. He ended up owning most of the town. This is today, but you can imagine what this house might have looked like in 1880. The houses show a series of changes over time as the new owners adapted them. The feeling of they just left yesterday is everywhere. I wonder how much money passed through this store safe. Two and a half billion dollars in gold in today's money was taken out of Bodie. Many of these homes tell volumes about the life that existed, both modest and opulent. These were expensive wall, fabric wall coverings and a hand carved bed. The stores carried everything, including the newest and the most fashionable. This is Boone's store, which looks much as it would have a hundred years ago, except there would be a fashionable dress on the dress form. If people in Bodie had money, they tended to spend it. A fancy carriage would make you look smart and stylish driving through town or down to Bridgeport, the county seat. If you had a carriage, you would, of course, want the clothes to go with it. Bodie's women dressed well and were no stranger to vanity. Julia Burnett shows off the high fashion of her day. When summer finally arrived, it was most welcome after the long winter. It snows every month of the year in Bodie. At midnight on July 4th, Bodie's 23 operating mines all let their steam whistles go simultaneously. It was the signal for a giant three-day celebration. Odd fellows, Elks and Masons would march, as well as veterans of the Mexican and Civil Wars. Everybody came out to watch and listen. The girls on this float are holding 38 pennants, one for each state in the Union at that time. There were games, contests, and foot races. The games involved most everybody. How many kids can fit on a donkey? Well, there are eight on this one. <laughs> the boys would often set off firecrackers and cherry bombs too, of course. There was a group called the Bodie Horribles 
who heaped abuse on the self-important, the pompous, and the rich. They appeared in a satirical procession, making discordant music and noise. Their slogan was, do unto others as you darn please without allowing them to return the compliment. <laughs> Except for a few holidays, mining operations never stopped. The stamp mills crushing the rock could be heard 24 hours a day. The standard mill is the only stamp mill that remains today. This is a five stamp battery, one of seven in the mill. These large heavy steel stamps go up and down like pistons, crushing the rock. The crushed rock would then vibrate down these tables, which were covered with copper plates that were coated with mercury. The mercury would absorb the gold. The mercury was then scraped off and boiled leaving only the gold. The mercury vapor was captured and cooled, making it liquid again to be reused. In the 1880s, a new process was developed for extracting the gold. John Stuart Kane built a plant in Bodie that had its vats of sodium cyanide, which would reprocess ore from the old crushed rock taking out gold the mercury process had missed, but it was dangerous work. This is pouring a gold ingot in the retort room of the stamp mill. There were many dangers in mining. The biggest danger was from dynamite and explosives that they needed to blast the gold out of the rock. But dynamite is always dangerous and accidents can and do happen. On July 10th, 1879 at 7.30 p.m., just as the wife of the mine hoisting engineer was bringing him his dinner, a gigantic explosion occurred, knocking her to the ground unconscious and hurling her baby 10 feet away, breaking its arm. Seven men were killed instantly Others had missing limbs, eyes, broken arms, ribs, shoulders, heads, just about everything. The undertaker's morgue was very soon filled. More victims followed in the subsequent days. Life was hard, hard and life was often short. At night, Bodhi took on another kind of aura. The Bodhi Cribs in the red light district was a world unto itself. Located on Bonanza Street, there were dance halls, saloons, and even mercantiles. Then there was one woman who was different, Rosa May. In her younger years, she worked in Virginia City and Carson City, but moved to Bodie in the early 1900s. Rosa May had a boyfriend, Ernest Marks, a Main Street bartender, but she also liked and saw other clients. She would listen to them, write letters home for them and darn their socks. She had the fanciest red lantern of anyone. When a pneumonia epidemic gripped Bodie, Rosa May tended to the sick, going from one cabin to another to console and nurse them back to health. Quote, many a time she closed tired eyes that would never open again, unquote. But the day came when Rosa May contracted pneumonia herself and a few days later died. The question was, where to bury Rosa May? Was she a saint or a sinner? Would she be buried in the town cemetery on hollowed ground or not? The town was divided. In the end, she was buried just outside the cemetery fence with the gunfighters. Most fallen women were buried there.
the Bodhi Morning News observed, whatever else may be said of the class known as fallen women, they are always to be found more generous, kind, and forgiving than in the case of their more virtuous sisters. As the gold became harder to get, people moved away and Bodhi became largely a place of empty buildings. So John Stuart Kane hired guards to protect the town against vandals, thieves, and collectors. The days of gold, the days of old, were gone. The people who came to Bodhi made nowhere somewhere. Those glory years were something to behold. In 1932, there were still about 100 people living in Bodhi. Many mine workers retired and just didn't leave until they died. There was still the hearse to carry them to the cemetery. Former miners or children who had grown up in Bodhi would come back. This picture shows a Hollywood movie crew that came in to make a film. Behind the saloon on June 23rd, 1932, a two and a half year old playing with matches lit a dangling piece of wallpaper. Look what I done, he told his mother as she rushed to the scene. The town raced to get the hoses but the neglected water mains were clogged with dirt and rocks. The fire spread quickly. They ran to the pumpers, but there was no water to refill them in time to be effective. Half the town was burned, but 170 buildings still remained. John Stuart Kane's bank burned to the ground. Only the large vault survived. Kane's wife started to have health problems, so they moved to San Francisco. But Kane returned to Bodhi periodically to make sure his town was okay. Kane's heirs sold the town to the state of California in 1967. It is now a state historic park with rangers on site. The gold and riches may be gone, but the magic is still there. Well, that concludes the story of Bodhi, all of which is in that book, uh, Bodhi, Good Times and Bad. And I'll answer some questions a little bit later, but right now I want to go to the second part of my talk to talk about these, some of these reflected pictures that you see, or it seemed like double exposures. Um, well, this is part of a technique that I developed in Bodhi, uh, I call photo reflections. And uh, it, it is a book, uh, excuse me. It's a process of shooting through windows from the outside and seeing what's on the inside the building behind the glass, as well as what's being reflected in the glass. This is taken in a single exposure and uh, there's no artificial manipulation. while looking through the window, it captures, as I say, both of those things. The, depend, the key is getting the light in the right uh, place to be able to get both the, what's inside the building and what's outside. Uh, the clear, because clear glass can be transparent or mirror-like depending on that light. You've seen how at times uh, the, the glass of panes are just like a bright mirror reflecting the sun. And other times you can see right inside. And, uh, but all of these images are recorded with pressing the shutter button once.
I always try to have a piece of the window frame in there so you have a, some sense of reference as on the right hand side of this picture. Uh, there's over a dozen images in the book of uh, using this technique. And uh, I developed it in Bodhi, as I mentioned, because I was looking for a different way to capture Bodhi. I'd been going there for almost 50 years and uh, uh, dozens of times and, and photographed it pretty thoroughly. But I said, is there a way to be able to catch more of the magic? Um, and through a process, I, st I stumbled on it in a way uh, through uh, getting escaping from a rainstorm. And, uh, and it was, uh, I, I developed that into the, the technique that you see. It took a couple years to do. But you see uh, that you're seeing the inside and outside at the same time. And you can, as in this picture here, you're seeing into the, the, uh, the counter in the kitchen and some of the, uh, the food stuffs they had there. On the left-hand side of the picture, you're looking out the, the door and seeing the buildings on, on, through that glass. The, the, on the right-hand side of the picture, all of the sagebrush and the buildings you see are all reflections in the glass. The, this technique is uh, a very, I found it very attractive because it make, gives you a feeling of going back in time. And that's the magic of, uh, of going to ghost towns. Um, and as you look at it, your eye wanders from one layer to the other, to the reflected, to the non-reflected image. So each time you see it, you, you see uh, a, a new, new things you notice new aspects of the picture. Uh, and it also makes it look somewhat ghost-like. Uh, and if you notice in the back here, uh, in the upper left, you'll see, you can see through the window that's in this, this room, uh, and it's looking out at the hills in the background, and it doesn't exactly match the hills because I'm that's not a reflected image that's seen straight through the glass. And I like the fact that each viewer has to discover the layers in the image for themselves. So each person can see different things. You connect with the image in your own way. This footage, uh, uh, this image is a, looks into the church. Uh, and I was at the, uh, giving a presentation in Sacramento to the California State Library and uh, the California State Historian. I asked him what he thought of the uh, picture. And he said, oh, it's very interesting. And I said, what do, what do you think of the hill? Um, and he looked at it and he said, what hill? Uh, he hadn't, he hadn't been able to see past the church pews and the church windows. And as, when, as soon as he began to see it, he, of course it was, uh, um, he, he said, wow, that's, that's amazing. I had, no, I had no idea seeing it. But once you see it, your eye goes back and forth to the two different images. The waviness that you see in the in the building on the left is because of the wavy glass, hand blown glass that they used in those uh, the early days. And that's the end of my talk. But th thank you all for. Uh, attending and I'll be glad to answer some questions. Just just uh, type them out in the chat chat uh, uh, function and uh, and then I'll be able to answer them. Okay. So well, there's a couple of questions. Uh, did you have to clean the glass before taking the photographs? Uh, mostly, I did not because once you start cleaning the glass, you find boy, is it dirty over. 
but because I'm very, very close to the glass uh, and uh, sometimes I would do some spotting uh, with in Lightroom, but uh, generally it did, did not need it. Um, it's funny, they, it's, it's so small, uh, it, clumps of dirt, yes, you definitely have to, uh, to uh, spot them. But, uh, but you, you, your eye doesn't see that. It just makes it look like it's a little bit of a wavy glass or something. Um, it's, it, you, you just don't see it. So someone else wants to know, the glass panes seem very symmetric. Is any of this older gla gra glass, is there any older glass still present? The, uh, in, in, at Bodie, all of the window frames, uh, even when they replace the window frames, they're, they're in exactly the same manufacturing that they're specially made. So they match the window frames of 1880. And the, uh, that, because of, they do rot out eventually and, and the state replaces them exactly as it's been, as they, as they were before. And um, so the, uh, and yes, there is a lot of wavy glass there. Um, it just depends if, if we have, when window panes get broken, of course they replace them with, with newer glass, uh, the regular glass that we have now. But I, I would say, I would venture to say probably uh, 35, 40% of uh, Bodhi is, is all wavy glass. Uh, which makes for an interesting other dimension with the photo reflections, because it it because uh, <laughs> you're compounding uh, things. So somebody else wants to know: Did you use a tripod with a shutter release so as not to capture your own reflection in the window? Yes, ah, very good. Now I always stand just a little bit off center. So, uh, so I don't see my reflection or the camera's reflection in the, the window pane. So uh, I'm, I'm never square on to the window because that would show me. Uh, but, and I always use a tripod. I always use a shutter, shutter release. So there can't, there's no possible vibration because uh, I want it to be as sharp as possible. And um, it is, uh, uh, and you have the moving the camera just even an eighth or a quarter of an inch when you're, uh, you're very close to a window. Most of the time I am uh, probably about six, 15 or 20 inches away from the, the window glass, just all out of view of, on, the, on the side. And, um, uh, it is, uh, and it, it's the move of the slightest movement of the camera has a tremendous amount of uh, effect on it because I mostly shoot with extremely wide angle uh, lens, mostly of 16 millimeter lens. And uh, but it might be a twenty or something, and uh, but but very wide in uh, because I want to see the, the the bigger picture of of what's reflected because uh, you're seeing an extreme wide shot um, uh, both into the hall, the building that you're looking at, and as well as the reflected image uh, behind. Someone wants to know if you have any recommendations for night shooting iconic buildings. They're going to be taking a, a trip soon and want to want some suggestions. Oh, um, well, the photo reflections, uh, you can't do at night because there's no, <laughs> there's, there's no light out there behind you. <laughs> if, if somebody had floodlights uh, lighting up what was reflected in the, in the window, that would be uh, the case, but um, uh, no, I, th I th just just uh, just get the depth of focus that you need um, to capture, get get everything in focus that you're 
uh, that you need. Uh, and, um, and your camera will probably automatically set uh, the amount of exposure that you want if you're going to shoot probably wide open. And, uh, uh, and then that uh, you, you, you will set, and you're flying up to about 30 seconds. Uh, your, your camera will do an auto foot auto uh, aperture up to about 30 seconds if you put it on the aperture priority. Well, someone here needs a, a little clarity. They, they seem to think you were inside. They said in these days, it's, it's, um, is it possible to get the kind of interior space access that you seem to get? Or maybe some of those internal images were used from others. But um, I, it's my understanding that you were outside and these were just reflections. You want to kind of talk about um, whether or not you can have access and, and it's my understanding you had no access. You were just outside. Well, uh, initially I did, but then as we got along in the, in the project, we needed more pictures. So I, I, um, I went, uh, joined a, a photo group that was had gotten that the state does give permission to groups um, uh, yeah, 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 through one of their the people who does regular photo workshops there and they do night photography and they uh, or and they also have photography where they go into a number of the buildings um, and so yes I did go into those buildings they are accessible with photo uh, workshops um, that you could call up Bodhi and find out who does photo workshops there. And uh, um, usually once or twice or three times a year, they have uh, do workshops where they can go inside. So I did shoot a number of them pictures inside, but most of the uh, film or the book was taken from the outside. Uh, it was only later on in the project that we needed some more pictures um, to to specifically go into the different aspects of life in uh, Bodhi, which we bring out in the book. And that could only be done by going into these buildings and selecting scenes to or shots to photograph that would uh, illuminate and, and 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 give us a view of that part of life. Uh, but it's, it's, it's just as exciting looking in from the outside. Whenever I could, I would try and do it from outside. Uh, anyway. Another question, is the lighting for your technique dependent on season? What is the range of time during the day uh, that is optimal? Are, are photo reflections available at dawn or golden hour sunset possible? Uh, would they would be possible with uh, with both? Uh, what the, what is crucial is is that you have bright light behind on the subject that's reflected. So in a sense, you're you're standing close to a building and you're shooting in the direction where the sun is. And so, but the glass is going to see that as a reflection in the glass. And because th th that bright the glass is mostly transparent. Um, so to get a, uh, to see a reflection in a window um, uh, of what's behind you, that what's behind you has to have a bright light on it. So uh, that's, the, that's the main key to being able to get, but you can do that right after sunrise and you can do it before sunset if it's lighting what's behind you. So in a sense, if, if the sun's setting, which it sets in the West, so if the camera was in, in a building pointing West, it would, you know, the reflection of what's behind me, uh, which is being lit by that setting sun would be, uh, uh, will be caught and you can have the two images together. And then we it does take some dodging and burning, lightning and darkening, um, but but it's that will give it give you uh, and if you bracket your exposure, you can uh, you will get a good picture 
out of out of a range of uh, exposures there, and uh, and you'll become more expert in how that light needs to be balanced. Uh, the more you, um, you you try it out, I have taken uh, this technique uh, all around the uh, Western United States. And I'm about to go to, uh, later this year to go to the East Coast because um, I'm, I'm going to want to do show pictures across the country of the, uh, using just this technique because I think it shows America in a different light and 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 uh, because it's not manipulated. There's no two. Um, images there to double exposure or superimposition of images. Uh, so you, in a sense, you, you get to see, to see America in a new way. Um, and uh, it's, it's exciting to, uh, to try this technique. And, and I, I, I was up recently in, in Yosemite uh, at the Iwani uh, hotel, hotel, the old, now it's the Majestic. But it, see, looking into that grand dining room and then seeing the mountains and the cliffs reflected in it are just very exciting. Um, it's just, it just has, it's a whole new experience of the place. Uh, and I guess that, that's what attracted me to the, the, um, to the technique because uh, it, it really does give you a, 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 a whole other reality. Um. Also, several people have, have, first of all, complimented you on the photography and the books, and they want to know if they miss part of this program, you know, how can they see it again? It is being recorded, so check back in a couple days on our Facebook page, and you can watch this again for any parts that you missed, or if you'd like to tell your friends about it, you will find it there on our Facebook page. And I have one final question. Uh, since both you and author Nick Clapp are involved in films and are both uh, award-winning authors and photographers, can you can you kind of tell us how you managed to collaborate with Nick? How did you meet him, and uh, you know how did you decide to do this with him? Well, um, uh, my a very good friend of mine, um, who started the uh, uh, the Trust for Public Land, um, and. Uh, he, he was a very good friend of Nick Clapp's uh, uh, from down in, in, in Borrego Springs where, uh, where Nick lives. And, uh, uh, and my friend used to go down there for a couple months every uh, summer. And uh, they, they became very, very good friends. Well, they, they, they and um, my good friend introduced me to Nick and, uh, and his wife, Bonnie, and we uh, hit it off immediately because we both had very similar backgrounds. I, had, I was in the motion picture business, had a, my own production company for 37 years and uh, um, made a lot of films, as you mentioned earlier. And uh, we, uh, we just hit it off and, and he, he was a real dynamo and, I, and the same similar kind of, uh, personality to mine so we said why not why not do this and and he'd always wanted to do a book on Bodhi and had never been able to get uh, uh, a publisher interested but the, my photo reflections techniques were really exciting and so uh, he took them uh, to you Diane and and, uh, and the company said yeah this is interesting stuff uh, but I've been shooting my whole life um, I, I did was the cameraman on most of the films that that I did and, and the commercials and and um, so I, I I loved and still photography was how I started out when I was a kid so it was wonderful uh, when I retired from the film industry to go back and um, uh, and and do still photography again because it's uh, it's so exciting to, to see. Uh, see beautiful pictures that capture the whole essence of a place. Uh, it's like doing most doing a, a motion picture scene, but having a, 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 the, the energy of a, of a whole scene happen in one still photograph and, and have that power keep drawing you back to see that picture again, because you want to see the different parts of it. And, um, uh, and that's the challenge. And uh, um, and Nick and I uh, both 
approach to uh, the, the subject matter in the same way. Let's make this town come alive like like nobody else has ever done it. And uh, um, and we said no, that, that we're not going to stop until we get something that's very unique. And uh, uh, and Nick's wonderful writing um, and uh, uh, is it's just a magical combination. That it is. And again, this book uh, has, if you really want to enjoy all these photographs, be sure and get this book. It's discounted for all the viewers. Um, so check out on our, on our website. And thank you so much, Will. I mean, the talent that you have is absolutely amazing. And I'm, and I'm really happy you're really not retired because you're still working on new projects many new projects and you were sharing a little bit with me so we look forward to seeing many more of your projects down the line and then for those of you that are, are curious about what our next spotlight will be we're going to focus on hummingbirds we have a a, a little book that um, is coming up it's it's called little jewel and it takes every single day of the beginning of the life of a hummingbird from when it's a nest and the, the mother sitting on the eggs for the 21 days and then hatching and then taking care of it and then fledging. So you'll be able to watch the, look at the photography. So this is another photographer and she has shot every single day in the life of, um, of a new hummingbird. So please join us for Little Jewel and that will be on July 8th. So um, check, the, check our Facebook and be sure to click on, uh, we never charge, it, we always record it. So if you miss it, you can always come back and take a look at it. And of course, every book that we feature is always discounted so you can get a good price on it too. Again, Will, thank you Sarah, very much for joining us for a Sunbelt Spotlight. It was really delightful. Thank you. Thank you.